Welcome to Reign of Grace. This program is brought to you by Reign of Grace Media Ministries, an outreach ministry of Eager Avenue Grace Church in Albany, Georgia. It is our pleasure and privilege to present to you the gospel message of the sovereign grace and glory of God in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that today's program will be a blessing to you. Thank you for listening, and now for today's program. Welcome to our program today. I'm glad you could join us. And if you'd like to follow along, I'll be preaching from the book of John, the Gospel of John in the New Testament, chapter 15. And I'm going to begin the message in verse 18 of John 15, where the Lord is teaching His disciples concerning uh, their relationship with the world, especially in evangelism, going out into the world and preaching the gospel. And the title of this message is this, Love from Christ, Hatred from the World. Love from Christ, Hatred from the World. Now he says here in John 15 and verse 18, he tells them, he says, If the world hate you, <clears throat> you know that it hated me before it hated you. So he's telling them that don't marvel. Don't be amazed. If in going out and preaching the gospel of Christ, you are confronted with people who literally hate you. Now, let me say this at the outset. Hatred of Christ and hatred from the world, and then obviously he's talking about unbelievers there, comes in different forms, in different degrees. In other words, it's not always the fact that, uh, you know, and of course many of these disciples, when they went out, they had people who picked up stones to stone them, uh, who arrested them, who threw them out of their house, and all, all kinds of things. But hatred for Christ and His truth, His gospel, can be shown just in ignoring it, denying it, walking away from it. Now that's what Christ said. He said, He that is not with me is against me. And the Bible says that in our unregenerate state, before being born again by the Spirit and being brought by God to faith in Christ, that we are His enemies, enemies in our minds by wicked works, Colossians chapter 1. So don't think that if, if you don't believe the gospel, that the gospel of God's free and sovereign grace in Christ Jesus, if you don't believe that, but you're just uh, uh, apathetic towards it, or you say, well, I don't want to hear that, just walk away, don't, don't think you're off the hook now on this issue of hatred. Now, there are people who just get very angry. I mean, I've had people get red-faced angry with me and, um, and just want me to leave, you know. Or, you know, thank God we live in a country where we have religious liberty. Uh, you know, I thank God for religious freedom. I think maybe some people uh, are trying to put that in jeopardy today. But I thank God for religious freedom. I th if, if you preach a false gospel, you have every right to do so. That's what, I, and I don't have any right to, bot to, to physically attack you or, or pass a law that'll stop you. I don't want you to preach a false gospel or believe a false gospel. And the gospel, even though you have the liberty to preach it and to live it, it's still untrue. And it's, it's a, a, it's a hell-bound message. But still, we need this, this freedom. But now back then in Christ's day, uh, they were uh, many times when they went out to preach the gospel, they were under penalty of, of being arrested, being uh, put to death. Uh, most of the apostles, well, all the apostles were martyred. Even John, he, he, was, he lived to be in old age, but they exiled him on the Isle of Patmos. So when he talks about hatred, understand that. But he says in John 15, 18, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. So why should it amaze a true disciple of Christ if the world, the unregenerate world, despises him, ignores him, hates him? 
when they despised and ignored and hated the Lord himself. That, that's his point there. And he says, verse 19, if you were of the world, if you were in fellowship with the world, in agreement with the world, the world would love his own. The world would love you. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. So you're not in fellowship with the world. If you're a believer, if you believe the gospel, wherein the righteousness of God is revealed, which is a righteousness that no sinner can produce. If you, pre if you preach the gospel of the glorious person of Jesus Christ, who is Jesus Christ? God in human flesh. God man. And if you preach the gospel of the power of his finished work, that all for whom he lived and died and was buried and arose again the third day shall be saved. And if you preach the sinfulness of man, the sinnerhood of man, that man is so, has fallen in Adam, so ruined and depraved and sinful that he's born spiritually dead and will not of his own will come to God, come to Christ, seek the Lord, that his best efforts to, to please God when aimed at the ground of salvation are an abomination to God. Literally, they, the God, if, you're trying to, if you're trying to be saved or accepted with God based on your works, whatever God you have in your mind who will accept you and receive you on that ground, that God is an idol. Now, that's right. Now, how do you like that message? You know, that's, that's the key. If that's, if that's the message you have, then you hate the gospel of Christ. And that's what he's saying here. The world hateth you. And he says in verse 20 of John 8, 15, Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. His saying, that's the gospel, what he's talking about. How God saves sinners. And the Bible says there's, not one, there's just one way that God saves sinners, and that's by His grace, based on the righteousness of His Son, the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And He will not save sinners on any other ground, on any other basis, through any other person. I know there are churches in this town who are being pastored by men and women who will tell you that there are more ways than one to God. I'm telling you, that's a lie. That's his saying, Christ's saying. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And it's not just Jesus. It's Jesus as he is identified and distinguished in the word as the Lord my righteousness. The Bible says that those who are ignorant of or not submitted to the righteousness of God are going about to establish a righteousness of their own, and they failed. Most people today don't even know what the righteousness of God is. It's the imputed righteousness of Christ. That's what the Bible teaches. It's His righteousness. It's the merit of His works charged, accounted to me by the grace of God. And I have no other righteousness before God. Now, if you have any other righteousness other than Christ, His righteousness, you're a lost person. And your deeds are evil. Now, do you like that message? Or do you hate it? Well, look over at John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, look at verse 18. Now, he'd just been talking to a religious man named Nicodemus. He told him, you must be born again. And he says in verse 18 of John 3, He that believeth on him, that is on Christ, this is John writing about Christ, he that believeth on Christ is not condemned. Now what does that mean? That means, well, he says, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. His name that identifies him and distinguishes him from all counterfeits. So if you don't believe in Christ as the one and only way of, to God, the one and only way of righteousness, the one and only way of forgiveness, 
by His sovereign grace. You're, and you stay in that state and die in that state, you die condemned. He says, and this, verse 19 of John 3, listen, and this is the condemnation. That light is come into the world. Now, who is the light? That's Christ. That's the gospel, the truth. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Now, what deeds did the light expose as being evil? Man's best efforts to save himself. Man's best efforts to make himself righteous so to be recommended unto God. You see, you cannot be saved by your best efforts. You cannot be made righteous by your best efforts. God is righteous and we are not. God must punish sin. God cannot show mercy and love and grace unless justice is satisfied. How can God save a sinner like me and still be God, still be just? still be holy and righteous and truthful. How can he do so and honor himself? Uh, I often put it this way. How can God be both a righteous judge, which he must be, as well as a loving, merciful, gracious father? How can he be both? There's not but one ground upon which God can do that, and that's the ground by his grace through the blood, the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 4 says, For Christ is the end, the fulfillment of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Well, look at John 3, 20. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Now, the evil there is man working, trying to work his way into God's favor. That's evil because it dishonors God. It's evil because it denies Christ. It's evil because it gives sinners room to boast. It's evil because it's the product of unbelief. You see, I, I want to do my best and I want to be right with God, but I cannot do that by my works. I have to look to Christ, the author and finisher of my faith. And he says, they, the, uh, Everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved, discovered, uncovered, exposed. Verse 21 says, But he that doeth truth, that's believing the gospel, repenting of dead works, they come to the light that his deeds may be manifest that they are wrought in God. That is, they are the work of God. I preached on that last week. I am the vine. You are the branches. You bear fruit from the vine. We'll go back to John 15. He says in verse 21, he says, But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake because they know not him that sent me. The reason that, that the world hates Christ and his disciples is because they hate a message that exposes them for what they are. Sinners who need mercy. Sinners who cannot make themselves righteous. Sinners <coughs> whose best deeds, best attempts to save themselves by their best works are condemned. Their deeds are evil. And this gospel message is uh, it exposes all false refuge. What is your refuge? Think about that. You know, you ask most people today about salvation. Are you saved? And they always go back to uh, a decision that they made when they were young, probably, you know, their baptism. My friend, is that your refuge? That's a false refuge. Here's the issue. What, upon what ground do you expect God to save you, accept you, receive you, bless you, hear you, and bring you to glory. Up on what ground? You say, well, I made a decision when I was 12. That's the wrong ground. I'm telling you. There's only one ground upon which God can do all those things, and that's the merit of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, His blood alone, His righteousness alone. Now, if you don't believe that, I, and if you're a churchgoer, if you claim to be a Christian, and you don't believe what I just said, then why do you sing hymns like, What 
can wash away my sin. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Remember we said, this is all my hope and peace. This is all my right. You see, what do you say? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly, and that is 100% lean on Jesus' name, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. You see, the ground of my salvation is not my decision for Christ. That's a fruit of salvation. The ground of my salvation is not my willingness, not my faith, not my repentance, not my perseverance. The ground of my salvation is the merit of Christ's blood and righteousness alone. You say, well, you're just splitting hairs. Well, you may think that, but I know this. When you stand before God at judgment, here's the issue. The issue is not how much faith did you have, how, much, how many works have you done. The issue is how do you stand in Christ? The Bible says in Acts 17, 31, that God has appointed the, uh, uh, a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, in that he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. How do I stand with Christ? Do I stand pleading my faith? Do I stand before God pleading my repentance, pleading my works? They don't equal what Christ has done. I stand before God, washed in the blood, and clothed in the righteousness of my Savior. That's my hope. That's my ground. That's my assurance. Well, go back to John 15. He says in verse 22, he says, If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. <clears throat> what does he mean by that? Well, the Bible says, Christ himself said, The Pharisees do indeed appear righteous unto men. They appeared to be moral. They appeared to be sincere, dedicated religionist. But when Christ came and preached the gospel, that shows us that we have no righteousness even by our best efforts to be dedicated, to be sincere, to be moral. That we're sinners and the best we do falls short for all of sin and comes short of the glory of God. And that there's only one righteousness that God will accept, the righteousness of His Son, which is the merit of the obedience unto death of Christ. What does that do? That removes the deception, the cloak, of an appearance of righteousness and exposes me as a sinner in need of mercy and grace. <clears throat> That's what he's saying. If I hadn't come and spoken, preached the gospel, he says they had not had sin. In other words, they wouldn't appear as to be really what they are. But now they have no cloak for their sin. He exposed it and it says in verse 23, He that hateth me hateth my father also. You know, you cannot love the Father and not love the Son. You cannot trust and believe in the Father and not trust and believe in the Son. I don't care what anybody says. The only way to the Father is through the Son. And that's it. And he says in verse 24, If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin, but now they have both seen and hated both me and my Father. So he preached the word. He did wonderful works that supported the authority of what he said, and therefore they hated him. And Christ said, they hate me, they hate the Father. They claim to believe in the Father. They claim that God, they claim that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was their father. But they did not receive God's Son. They did not believe and love him. Well, they hated the Father too. They just, their idea of the Father was an idolatrous one one who would receive them and accept them based on their works. So verse 25, he says, But this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled, that it is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. And there he, he quotes from uh, the Psalms, talking about his relationship to the world. They had no right to hate him, but they did. He was just telling them the truth. 
You know, preachers today try to do their best to pack their church buildings with people by doing what? By telling unbelievers, the natural man, what they want to hear. Christ didn't do that. He told them what they needed to hear, and they hated him without a cause. Verse 26, he says, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. Not to speak of himself, not to just make you feel good or get you into some kind of a religious frenzy. The work of the Spirit is to point sinners to the Son, to point to Christ. And that's what he does. That's how you know the work of the Spirit. He convicts of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, and it all has to do with Christ. He convicts me that I'm a sinner because my efforts always fall short, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He convicts me of righteousness that can only be found in Jesus Christ, who lived, died, was buried, arose from the dead, and ascended to the Father. The Spirit shows me that without Christ, the law of God does nothing but condemn me, even at my best, and that the perfection of righteousness that the law requires can only be found by God's grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he does. And he continues, he takes the word and he points sinners to Christ. And verse 27 of John 15 says, And you also shall bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. They're going to preach the same gospel. Now down in chapter 16, let me just read you a couple of verses here. He says in verse 1 of John 16, these things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. What he's saying there, as far as the offense, it means you shouldn't be tripped up. I'm telling you these things beforehand that you won't trip up, trip over them later. Verse 2, they shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Verse 3, and these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. And then verse 4 lastly, but these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. So Christ is forewarning them of what's coming from the world. And he said, this is even going to come from the uh, unbelieving Jews. How do you know that? He said, they'll throw you out of the synagogues. They're religious services. Now, let me say this. Today, there's a big movement called Christians and Jews together. Well, let me tell you something about that. Uh, and I've had people ask me about Israel. Should we support Israel? And I always say, yes. Politically and economically, we should support the state of Israel. I, I, I'm uh, glad that our president is a uh, supporter of Israel politically and economically. But we, as, we who believe the gospel, we who are Christians, have no biblical right to support Israel religiously because they're, uh, the, on, on the whole, I mean, I, you know, there may be some Christian Jews. That's great. They're my brothers, sisters in Christ. They're not, just, uh, they're not Christians and Jews together. They're just all Christians together. But when it comes to, to having fellowship with unbelievers, whether they be Jewish or Arab or whatever, we are commanded not to have fellowship with unbelievers. He said to his disciples, they'll throw you out of the synagogues. How can I have fellowship in the synagogue where the gospel is not preached? Where Christ is not preached? Where Christ is not exalted? I pray for the salvation of all unbelievers, Jews included. I've had people who, who tell me they believe that in the future, before Christ comes again, that Christ is going to save the whole Jewish nation. Well, now, I don't believe the Bible teaches that, but let me tell you this. If it were true, I would jump for joy. But I would be just as, uh, as happy if God saved the whole Arab nation or the whole United Nations. <laughs> All of us, United States. Uh, I want God to save sinners. I pray for the salvation of sinners. 
That's the love that Christians are ex to express to their neighbor. It's not a love that brings them into fellowship with unbelievers. It's a love that prays for and promotes their salvation by telling them the truth. Even at the peril of them hating what I say and hating me. That's what Christ did. He told them the truth. Why didn't he have fellowship in the synagogue? You know what, he, you know what happened when he went back to his hometown synagogue in Nazareth? They read from the book of Isaiah 61 and he got up before them and he said, today this is fulfilled before your eyes, meaning I'm the Messiah. That's what he said. And you know what? They, he didn't have fellowship in the synagogue. With, it wasn't Christians and, fellow, and Jews fellowshipping. They brought him outside to throw him over a cliff. They wanted to kill him. And he walked unharmed through the crowd because it wasn't his time. That's not the way he was to be killed and it wasn't his time. So don't get me wrong. I, I pray for the South, you know, I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I want peace in the Mideast. I want uh, 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 the Israeli nation today is the only democracy that I know of in the Mideast and I support them politically and economically, but not religiously. I cannot have fellowship religiously with anyone who doesn't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who hasn't repented of dead works, who isn't walking by faith in Him according to this book from Genesis to Revelation. That's what we have to understand. This is the issue of the love that comes from Christ and the hatred that comes from the world. Do we love Christ or do we love the world? That's the fellowship with Christ and not fellowshipping with the world. That's the whole issue. So understand, he said, if the world hates you, don't be amazed. It hated me before it hated you. Why did it hate our Savior? The Savior, because of what he preached to them that exposed their false religion and false hopes. Hope you'll join us next week for another message from God's Word. We are glad you could join us for another edition of Reign of Grace. This program is brought to you by Reign of Grace Media Ministries, an outreach ministry of Eager Avenue Grace Church in Albany, Georgia. To receive a copy of today's program or to learn more about Reign of Grace Media Ministries or Eager Avenue Grace Church, write us at 1102 Eager Drive, Albany, Georgia 31707. Contact us by phone at 229-432-432. 6969 or email us through our website at www.theletterrofgrace.com Thank you again for listening today and may the Lord be with you.